Good morning, everyone. I hope you can listen to me well. I'm very happy to be with you today. My name is uh, Lisette Ramirez. I am analyst for offshore wind at Wind Europe. And today we have the third of a series of dissemination events of our core wind project, which aims to the cost reduction of floating wind technology. Today, I am joined by four experts who are now on camera with me. So I'll be introducing them quickly to you. I'm joined by Jose Ignacio Rafa from IREC, which is the Catalonia, Catalonia Institute for the Energy Research. Uh, also, Valentin Aramuent from INOC. Hello, good morning, everyone. Maria Antoniette from Rambol. Good morning. And finally, Alvaro Rodriguez Luis from the Environmental Hydraulics Institute, IH Cantabria. Good morning. So, this will be a very good webinar. Now, let's dive into some rules first. Everyone in this webinar is muted, so but we encourage you to send you send us questions. So please just type your question. You should see on your screen this question bar, and you just have to write your question and hit send button. We will be able to have uh, 10 or 15 minutes uh, for Q and A at the end of all of the presentations. Now this is the agenda. So now I will be talking to you about what is the EU policy context for floating wind. Then we will have a presentation from Ignacio, Jose Ignacio Rafa on the introduction to the core wind project and also the optimization of floating wind farm layout. Then we will have a presentation from Valentin on the impact of peak load reduction systems of mooring system, Maria Antoniette, for the assessment of floating wind operation and maintenance strategies. And finally, Alvaro will talk to us about the mooring and cable dynamics. This is an experimental and numerical approach. And then, as I said, we'll have time for some questions from you and to make some conclusions and remarks. So yes, I'm very happy to be here. And just for you to know, and I know Jose Luis will tell us more about the core wind, but this is a project that has uh, is funded from the EU Horizon 2020, the Research and Innovation Program from the European Union, and is looking into how can we make better floating systems? How can we design the system together with the moorings, the anchors, the dynamic cables? This is using uh, support uh, supporting turbines of a reference 15 megawatt, which is very much in line with what we see today. And it's also, of course, looking at all of the challenges that come with this, like the installation techniques, the operation and maintenance, and the, the final goal is to reduce the levelized cost of electricity. So say no more. And now we will start with what's happening in the EU policy context. So today, we have in Europe 113 megawatts online of floating wind capacity. This is across the following countries, as you see in this map, it's showing you all of those projects that are at the moment already operational or under construction. You might recognize that this year, actually the largest uh, project for floating was installed. I'll give you more details in a moment. These 113 megawatts are equivalent to having, uh, at the moment, 18 turbines connected to the grid. And it's catching up quickly, because now this is what we have at the moment, but the pipeline and the future of floating wind is prominent. In fact, the pipeline today is of about 20 gigawatts plus in Europe. You can see now in this map that is slightly different, not only the projects that are online and under construction, but also everything that is in the pipeline in some kind of permitting process. 
So, and where are these 20 gigawatts, you might ask yourself? Well, I hope you are not living on the rocks, but in the past month, a Scott Winsibet lease in the UK has announced the winners of this and 15 gigawatts of the capacity that has been awarded is going to be floating wind. So that's already a lot of this pipeline that I'm mentioning to you. Also, the Spanish um, offshore wind roadmap has been published um, uh, almost uh, when we finished last year. And this aims to install between one to three gigawatts of offshore wind capacity in Spain. This is great. But we know it will be mostly floating because of the water depth conditions and the bathymetry in this region. It's not only there, as you see in this map, the Mediterranean Sea has a lot of um, activity that is being led by mainly developers in Italy and around, and also Ireland, where we know that although one of the parts is more suitable for bottom fix, you can see here that the west coast is more suitable for floating wind. So this is where floating is standing at the moment. We love pictures. And here you can see at the moment, which is the largest operational uh, project for floating wind in the world. This is King Cardane, and it's located in the UK. It's 15 megawatts in total. and it also hosts at the moment the largest turbines that are floating. They are nine and a half megawatts. Um, and, and this is great because we are installing at the moment the same uh, turbines that Bottom Fix does. Even if Bottom Fix, it's already a much more deployed technology. It's not only in the UK where we had updates this year, also in Norway we had the installation of this that you see in the photo is the Tetraspar demo. And this is uh, testing the foundation tubular steel concept by Stisdal. This is a very disruptive technology that using a different system, it's also promising to reduce the cost of floating wind. The type of foundation is slightly different than the previous. So the previous is a semi-submersible, whereas this one is a spar, more suitable for deeper waters. But countries can still go an extra mile. And this is why I take a minute to remind you that Wind Europe has published a policy paper on how countries can scale up floating towards competitiveness. What does that mean? How do we set up auctions for floating? How do we ensure that there is enough space at sea for floating? And we have five main recommendations here. We are also scoping these uh, to make these recommendations to the countries that you see in this slide, because either they have a very good potential for floating or they have also already a target as part of their national energy and climate plan. So we ask them that they review their national energy and climate plans, because now that we have a new policy, which is the Fit for 55, that aims at more reduction in the CO2 emissions, we know that more renewables can also do this. So we know that floating and offshore in general will play a crucial role. So this can be done through increasing targets and also allocating the areas for floating wind. We ask to countries, uh, we ask countries to host technology specific auctions. A very good example here is the UK. To tackle the financing costs, to make floating grid connection a top priority, and finally to facilitate the industrialization of the supply chain. Now we have to move on. And I will now welcome uh, Jose Ignacio Rafa from IREC to tell us more about the Core Wind project. Over to you, Rafa. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, uh, as Lisette said, the Core Wind project is about mainly reducing costs because 
as probably you as probably you know, uh, the floating offshore wind costs are quite high, and at this moment is not uh, is not viable 100% without any subsidies. So the aim of this project is reducing the LCOE by 15% uh, compared to the preference uh, offshore wind uh, LCOE from 2014, and that was around 127 euros per megawatt hour. Okay, so okay. this is the list of the partners that we have in the consortium, because this is a three year long project and uh, we have a number of, of partners involved, uh, namely JDR for the cable systems, we have Equinor that you probably already know, we have UL, we have ETU, the uh, Denmark Technical University, we have uh, Rumble from Germany and the University of Stuttgart, we have Innoci from France, we have Wind Europe, of course, Politecnico Milano, we have IAC Cantabria, and Cobra as an enterprise, uh, as a company, sorry, for the, for the product design. And from Barcelona, we have IREC and the Polytechnic University of Catalonia. On the right side, you can see the advisory board of the project. And um, as you can see, this is a well, very nice, nice consortium with participation of lots of countries from Europe and uh, from different disciplines. So we are covering almost all the parts of the floating offshore wind technology. Uh, right now, we are we are in the month 30 of the project uh, of 42 months, so we already crossed uh, the half um, of the project. And at this moment, we are working on the mooring and the dynamic cable optimization. We, today, we will hear about this, uh, for example, the mooring designs and the optimi optimization of, of the mooring system. Uh, we are working with the experimental validation, and today we will also uh, hear about that. We are working on the development of digital digital tools. Uh, so, uh, for example, the beam models applied to offshore wind, or also the advanced control of wind farms. This, for example, uh, can lead to increased uh, lifetime of the wind farms. And also, we are always updating our LCOE and LCA updates. The LCOE, as you know, the levelized cost of energy, uh, which is the main target, but we are always keeping an eye on the life cycle assessment, so the environmental impact of the wind farms. We have a website that you can check at any moment. Uh, you have here the link. Uh, in that place, uh, we have information about the project, the consortium, and the public deliverables. Apart from that, we have public models available, available yeah, um, under different Creative Commons licenses in Zenodo. And for example, we have the UPC Wincrete uh, model. Wincrete is the substructure developed by UPC. And we also have the Active Float uh, substructure. Uh, which is developed by Cobra and the Steco, and both of the both models are available in the Enodo website. Just uh, apart from this, just mention that the all the analysis carried down in in Corwind is around 15 different reference scenarios around the globe. Um, that is Gran Canaria, it is the west of Barra Island and it is Moro Bay in the United States. And we are also working with different wind farm sizes and the different partners are working on these uh, reference scenarios to see which is the improvement on the LCOE and which is the percentage of improvement achieved by the different categories. So that was everything uh, talking about the introduction. And now, yeah, well, uh, no. thank you very much, Jose. Well, you have to continue with us, but now yeah. let's focus and please tell us about how uh, do we optimize the layout of floating wind farms. We continue with you. 
Okay, thank you. Yeah, so as, as I mentioned, and, and also Lisa said, uh, the cost reduction is the main objective uh, of, the, of this project. And one of the drivers is the layout. The layout understood as the micro siting of the turbines in the wind farm. So uh, I will cover in the next minutes this part. Uh, here we have the, the, the index. So first I will talk about the problem description. So which are the considerations to have with this, with the layout optimization? So where are we going to place the turbines? Then I will talk about the approach that we had to, to solve this problem. I will show some results of three different reference scenarios. And uh, of course, uh, I will mention some conclusions and further work that can be done on this. So the wind farm microsiding is a process of establishing the exact location of each terrain in the farm. If there were offshore substations, that would also be part of the problem. In the case I will show today, uh, there will not be offshore substations, but it can be easily applied. The same, the same uh, algorithm. So the typical layouts that we have in offshore wind farms are, as we can see in these different uh, drawings, maybe the most simple is this rectangular matrix with the equidistant turbines in both directions. Originally, this was the, the type of offshore layouts that we had, but this has been evolving, especially for bottom fixed wind, and now uh, almost no, no wind farm is designed with this type of layout. However, this one is the most simple to design, most simple to install, etc. Once uh, having said that, we also have a different layout, which is also a, a matrix, but in this case, the spacing is not the same. This is because the wind farm layout has a position and especially a rotation according to the prevailing wind speed. Due to the weight losses, the spacing in the wind direction, in the prevailing wind direction, is higher than the uh, spacing in turbine, between turbines that are perpendicular to the uh, prevailing wind direction. In this case, for example, the wind direction would come from the right or from the left. Then we have additional designs, for example, this stagger matrix, where we have the alternatively the rows or the columns uh, moving. And uh, finally, we have uh, a regular matrix of turbines, uh, which is uh, always designed to an optimization process. And this can lead to further uh, cost reductions. Today, we are going to talk about this type. OK, so which are the key drivers of the layout? So which are the information to, to consider when we are trying to define the layout of an offshore uh, floating wind farm? Well, we have the waves. I already mentioned that uh, the waves are, are an important factor. The waves reduce uh, basically uh, the wind speed and increase the turbulence of the, of the wind. So it is something important, at least, uh, well, from, from many uh, different points of view, from the point of view of the um, energy yield, from the point of view of the substructure, fatigue, etc. So this is something important because if we place two turbines too close, then the turbine that is uh, behind probably is going to generate much less wind. Then we also have the local wind speeds. Uh, this means that in the same site, we may have different wind speeds. Of course, this is relevant only in wind farms, uh, which are large, in, in large areas. Otherwise, uh, it can be assumed that the wind speed, uh, that the free stream wind speed, is the same for all the turbines. We have the, the bathymetry, of course. Uh, this is a very relevant factor, and because here in, in floating wind, as you know, we are working um, starting from 60 meters depth, and we think that we can make it until 1,000. So there's a lot of variation in the bathymetry, and with more depth, it is more expensive the mooring system because the mooring lines are longer. The same happens with the dynamic cables, but the dynamic cables that has two different 
consequence. That the first one is, is the price, but additionally, we have an increased um, energy loss in the cables due to its length. So it is something quite relevant. Then we have the soil conditions, because this will determine the anchor type to be used. We have the lease fee, uh, that is the amount uh, that has to be paid uh, to use the area during a certain uh, time. There are different approaches, and this is more country-specific information, but there's always uh, some, some kind of fee. And lately, in the last auctions, we have seen very, very high prices. So this is something relevant, uh, basically, because the higher the footprint of the poor wind farm, the higher the lease fee. And this may lead to uh, more compact uh, layouts. We have the mooring design which will limit the spacing between the turbines. It's like, it's, yeah, it's a minimum distance. Then we can have more distance or less distance, but we have a minimum and that's because otherwise the mooring lines will overlap. And this of course is specific of protective. We cannot, uh, we don't have this kind of restriction in bottom feet. Then we have the electrical layout. So how are the turbines connected between them? Then we have the minimum distance to shore, which also depends a bit on the country. But uh, we can say that a minimum distance can be of eight kilometers, but it can, this can be increased uh, depending on the on the site and, and the country. And we have uh, an additional driver, which is the distance to the base port, because this will influence the operation and maintenance. Um, more distance means more cost, and probably if, if if the turbines are quite far from the port, then we need uh, a wider weather window to work. So this also influences the overall LCOE of the different turbines of the wind farm. Sorry. So the approach uh, approach that we have uh, in this project for the layout optimization, uh, well, we have different options. The simplicity, as I mentioned first, um, which is just a regular layout, but this is no longer um, an option, actually. Then we have the low LCOE, so low levelized cost of energy, and depending on the country, others um, are more, depending on, on the option, uh, it's more important the energy density. We will focus on the LCOE optimization. To do this, we have developed a PSO algorithm. So that's a particle farm optimization, which is a population-based heuristic optimization algorithm. The reason of using this kind of heuristic algorithm is that the wind farms, and especially the LCOE calculation of the offshore wind farms, is so complex that we cannot use a deterministic algorithm. And that's the reason why we use the heuristic. This one, uh, the PSO, replicates the behavior of some collective animals, just in case someone finds that, that curiosity nice. So yeah, and it was presented in 1995. So it's a, a, an algorithm that has very, uh, it is widely applied in, in, that, in different disciplines and it has also a lot of variants. But it's a quite mature and it leads to good results, very good results and converts quickly. Additionally, it allows parallel computation, which is good for the simulation of complex, case, or complex uh, cases, because one can perform this uh, computation in different, using different cores of uh, one computer or multiple computers. Here below, we have an image uh, to, to try. I will try to explain quickly how this works. So initially, we have a number of particles, which are these pink dots, and these particles are moving in space, in an n-dimensional space. And this star, this blue star, uh, represents the solution, the optimal solution. And iteration after iteration, these particles approach to this solution, and their speed is every time uh, slower and slower and slower. So at the end, the, of course, if everything is going well, then we will have all the particles more or less around the solution. This is achieved by considering the best solution of all the particles 
considering the best solution of each particle and some inertia, random inertia, additionally, to, to move the particles around the space and do not stick to local optimums. Of course, as this is an heuristic optimization, uh, the global optimum is, is never assured, but uh, in general, we have observed quite, quite nice results. So the key drivers for this, uh, well, uh, I already mentioned them. So for this optimization, how are we treating them? So regarding the methodology, we have considered the Janssen model because it is a fast wave calculation and uh, it is enough for the energy calculation. So there are more complex models, but they are uh, quite far more complex and far more slow. So that would not be suitable for this purpose. Then we calculate the electrical grid losses using power, flow, power flows, so that's quite accurate. And the initial solution, so the initial LCOE, is a 70 by 70 regularly spaced matrix, where 70 is seven times the rotor diameter. As we are working with 15 megawatt turbines uh, with 240 um, meters of diameter, this is a quite uh, big matrix. So regarding the assumptions, uh, we didn't consider variations of the free stream along the side. We considered that the mooring and the riser costs increase linearly with water depth. We don't allow the mooring lines crossing and the same for, for the cables, because that would probably increase a, a lot the, the cost of the wind farm and especially the operational maintenance cost. So that's not allowed. Then we consider the mooring footprint constant. So different depths have the same mooring footprint uh, understood as the mooring radius. And the same anchor is used for all the turrets. So we are not considering the soil variations. We consider this, as I said, depends a lot on the country, but we consider a lease fee of 0 0.2 euros per square meter. Uh, this can change, but for the to reflect how the PSO works, uh, we consider this is a, like an average uh, cost and uh, we use this. Then we have the electrical layout predefined. So the connections are predefined. Of course, the cable lengths change depending on the turbines positions. And then we consider the operational maintenance cost constant. So this is the first one, the first result. Scenario with only four turbines in a mostly flat area, where we have an initial LCOE of 131.8 euros per megawatt hour. And after the optimization, we achieved 126.7 euros per megawatt hour. So that's a reduction of 3.9%. That may sound small, but we are talking uh, about uh, yeah, a lot of money. Only a 3.9% is quite a lot. And this is the optimal positions of the turbines. As we can see, we have in this uh, site, which is, by the way, more of a, we have a prevailing wind direction, which is the northwest. And, and we see that after the optimization, all the turbines are perpendicular to this um, prevailing wind direction. And they are the closer they can be, because these gray circles represent the moving footprint. So no turbine can be closer than this. If we check a second scenario, this one is in Gran Canaria Island where we can see that the initial LCOE quite low, 64 euros per megawatt hour, and 60.9 euros per megawatt hour is the achieved LCOE. The reasons why uh, this LCOE is so low include the short distance to, to shore and other parameters, but that's not what I want to, to talk about today, so in another occasion. In this case, we see that the LCO reduction is a 4.8%. So again, is an important number. And in this case, we see how the turbines are located in this case, in the shallowest waters and close to this blue area, which is the eight kilometer limit from shore. Because this uh, brown area is the land, represents the land. And this blue area represents the buffer, the eight kilometer buffer. So in this case, additionally, we have the, uh, again, one prevailing wind direction, with the, which is north-northeast, which is coming from the upright of this graph. And this influences all the, the positions of the, of the turbines. 
And finally, we have this scenario with 20 turbines in an irregular area because the previous one had a lot of steep, but it was constant. Here we have this area where we have like bumps in the seabed. And in this case, the initial LCOE uh, opposite to the first one, this one is quite high, 247.5 euros per megawatt hour, and we achieved uh, 236.8 euros per megawatt hour, which represents a reduction of 4.3% on the LCOE. In this case, we see that many turbines are not uh, so close as maybe in the, in the previous cases, and this is why in this case the wakes are more important because we have uh, winds from different directions and this is spreading the wind farm uh, layout. Of course, this has uh, an impact because the fee is calculated based on the area of the wind farm of the of these uh, turbines. So, uh, in this case, it's worth increasing the area to have better winds or stronger winds. So, as a conclusions, uh, we can say that. Floating offshore wind farms, the micro siting, depends on a lot of factors. I, I stated uh, many of them and not even all of them. So it's a, quite a complex task. Mm -hmm. And this requires a multidisciplinary work because otherwise the wind farms mm, could be optimized in one way, but then other costs would increase. So the final LCOE uh, would not improve. Um, then uh, regarding the proposed PSO, we see that it behaves correctly when optimizing the, the layout. We need around one hour for four turbines and four hours for 20 turbines, but this is only using a laptop and without parallel cal calculations. However, this is to find the optimums, uh, the, um, the some suboptimal solutions may be found in a matter of yeah, minutes. And the reason is that the most part, the major uh, improvements are achieved in the first iterations. Then, uh, regarding the overall LCOE minimization, we see that we are between a three percent and a five percent, uh, which is quite quite good because it's just moving the turbines around. Uh, it, we are not talking about uh, buying cheaper. We are just uh, talking about designing smarter. So that's quite quite good news. And finally, uh, we see that the bathymetry, the wind climate, the anchor radius, and the cable lengths are relevant, but that depends on the site, the site conditions. In one site, it's more important the bathymetry. In a different site, it's more important the wind climate, and so on. No, I... And... Uh, just as uh, now, just uh, the last thing I want to say is just as a further work that we need to carry, uh, we see that we have uh, improved the COE based on the micrositing, but yet we have to Im implement some, some improvements in our model, including the pre stream variations, the variation in the soil conditions the variation on the operation and maintenance costs, and last but not least, uh, perform the optimization given a fixed site, because now we are working around the point, but instead we could uh, also work uh, with a fixed area, and then uh, of course allow a different number of turbines. So thank you for, for your attention, and that was all. Thank you very much, Jose. That was extremely interesting. Uh, it's also good that we understand that optimizing uh, layouts is not uh, that straightforward and people tend to undermine the importance of all of these variables. So thank you for that. And also the results look uh, promising. Uh, people might think 5% is not a lot, but I just said it very well. It's about doing smart uh, seating. So now I welcome our next speaker. Uh, he is uh, Valentin Aramwent. I hope my French is uh, not too rusty. And now he is going to walk us through a different topic, which is the impact of the peak load reduction system on the mooring design. So Valentin, over to you. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, so um, 
the main goal of this presentation will be, uh, as Lizette just said, to present a bit uh, the results that we found uh, within the work package two of of current project, uh, and mainly on uh, the optimization of mooring system using uh, some peak load reduction system. So basically, this uh, this task is is uh, is going within uh, this this uh, subtask of uh, technological benefits regarding peak load reductions, and the aim is to uh, assess uh, the applicability of those systems on mooring optimization and uh, on peak load reduction, and then uh, that might help to reduce uh, the size of the mooring system and then uh, the price. So uh, basically, we are going to have a look at two systems that uh, we studied uh, within these projects, which are uh, TFI mooring system and the IMS mooring system. So I, I will uh, detail a bit the, the system in, in the next slides. Um, okay. So first of all, for the, the TFI. Uh, um, peak load reduction system. It's a, it's a polymer um, system that works in in compression. So basically, you you attach your mooring line to to, the, to both ends, and then it will compress compress this uh, polymer uh, material. So uh, we had uh, some meetings with uh, the the technology supplier, and uh, they gave us uh, all the needed data that we needed to do. Uh, the work that we did uh, within this this project. So we basically we add um, a spreadsheet uh, that allows us to uh, calculate uh, the size of the system for the different size of the, of the marine system. And we also received um, the cost function uh, for uh, this uh, those systems. Uh, we integrated uh, those system in our uh, optimization uh, tool that we developed. Uh, in the first year of, of the Corwin project, which is able to screen a large uh, number of uh, marine design and then to optimize at the end the cost of, of the marine system. Um, so basically the main conclusion that we, you will see is that it, might, it, it allows us to reduce the peak loads, then the chain diameters, but uh, and, the other, and the opposite, it will increase uh, the max, the maximal uh, horizontal offset of the system. So this is um, what has to be balanced to, uh, to manage to reach uh, the design criteria um, of the marine system. Um, so just uh, to illustrate a bit what we, we found, for example, for uh, the active float floater and for site B, which is Grand Canaria that I will just present after, we managed to reach about 8% uh, of peak load reduction uh, in uh, the upwind line. So what you see here, here is the time series of the, the line tension um, with uh, an optimize, uh, optimized uh, mooring system um, without a peak load, peak load reduction system. And the right side, you see it uh, with the peak load reduction system. And what you see is that we managed to uh, smooth a bit uh, the big peaks in the, the line tensions. Um, the other system that we studied is the IMS uh, called the Intelligent Mooring System. And this system is a bit different because it uses uh, uh, a pre-charge uh, accumulator, uh, which allows us to modify the stiffness of this uh, part, um, depending on the pressure that you have uh, in this accumulator. So we also integrated the system in our optimization software. And uh, just uh, as an example, um, on previous simulation on uh, an aerial five megawatt uh, floating offshore wind turbine, they show that they can manage to uh, decrease uh, the peak loads between 9 to 21 percent, which is quite impressive. But um, as for the TFI, uh, it, it will also uh, increase the surge. Um, so we also add from the supplier uh, all the data and we integrated it in our optimization software and we tested uh, five different pre-charge 
of pressure and two different preloading of the system. So let's um, jump a bit into uh, the cases that we studied uh, within this uh, subtask. So basically, we uh, implemented those two uh, systems in the optimization uh, software, and we uh, studied those uh, systems for three sites that are the sites studied in Corwin project and two floaters. So the three, three sites are uh, Morro Bay, Gran Canaria, and west of Barra. Uh, and the two floaters are the Wingcrete floater and the active float floater. And we managed to optimize the marine system for the, all the sites and the two floaters, except for site A, active float floater, because this site I will uh, jump into just after is quite arch and uh, it gives some really high tensions and it didn't uh, wasn't we didn't manage to find an optimization uh, mooring system for this site um, just uh, to show you where are the different sites so the site a uh, which is uh, waste of barra is in scotland then we have the site b in Gran canaria and we have the site c which is uh, morro bay uh, in the californian coast um, and the two floaters studied are the wingcrete, which is a spar in concrete, and you have the active float, which is a semi-submersible floater, also in concrete. So let's uh, jump into the, the results for uh, the different sites and floaters. So for um, site A, which is uh, west of Barra, um, for the active float floater and the TFI uh, system, um, as you can see, uh, this system help manage uh, to reduce the size of the chain diameter. But um, as this uh, this site is really arch, we have a really a complex marine system with six lines upwind and six lines downwind. And we have two uh, TFI systems per line. So at the end, it gives 12 systems. Um, so even if uh, this system managed to reduce the size of the chain and the nylon section that we have in the marine system, at the end, we have a cost increase of 15%. Why do we have that? Uh, because as I said, we have uh, 12 TFI system. Uh, sorry, 24 TFI system because we have 12 lines and um, they are uh, quite costly. Uh, so even if uh, we manage to decrease uh, the to total price of the marine lines by 17% and the total price of anchors by 12%, we increase the, the, pl the price of the, the lines by 44% using those, the system. Um, so at the end, for this site, we didn't manage to optimize the, the marine system. Uh, just keep in mind that this site is uh, really arch and uh, it's not representative to, to, to other sites. Um, as, as I said before, for uh, the IMS uh, mooring system, we didn't manage to find uh, a working configuration because um, the system was uh, uh, inducing some higher uh, tension in the line and we didn't manage to find a working configuration. So this is uh, quite typical for West of Barra site, which is uh, quite complicated. So now if we, if we jump to the, to the site B, which is Grand Canaria, uh, which is um, more uh, in line with the other uh, floating offshore wind turbine site that we are going to to have in the industry. Uh, if we look for, uh, if we look at the active float floater, um, we found uh, an optimized uh, mooring system that we compare to uh, the first optimized mooring system that we had before using those peak load reduction system. So um, it it also shows that it reduces the chain uh, diameter that is used for uh, this catenary marine system for active float. And at the end, we manage to reduce 
the price for both system TFI and IMS by 18% uh, for uh, the TFI and 11% for the IMS. So this is really encouraging to see uh, those results and especially for uh, this site which is uh, I would say uh, more uh, consistent with all the, the sites that we are going to have in, in the industry. So to go to go a bit uh, in, into into detail, so um, yeah, so, um, for the Wingcrete uh, flutter and for the same uh, site, uh, we uh, also have a catenary uh, mooring system with uh, chains, and as you can see, those uh, two systems um, offered the possibility to reduce the price of the mooring system by 27%. So for both floaters, which are two different technologies, what we see is that we uh, managed to reduce the price uh, quite impressively. Um, so how did uh, we manage to uh, reduce the price? Um, for uh, the implementation of the TFI and IMS system are responsible of 12 to 20 percent of cost increase because those systems have a cost but in parallel to this this is compensated by 23 to 33 percent of the mooring system uh, cost because we managed to reduce the the chain size the chain grades and the anchor uh, size um, finally uh, if we go to the last site, which is a uh, Moro Bay site, um, which is a site with a really high water depth of approximately uh, 800 meters, uh, what we see is that for active float flutter and for both system, we also managed to reduce the size of uh, the polyester and the chain, but um, at the end, uh, we have a cost increase of uh, 20 to 16 percent using the system. If we uh, have a look at the Wincrete system, we managed to reduce uh, the price of the of the of the global mooring system by six to eight percent. So, as you see, it's quite also sensitive to the to the floater, depending on uh, the site type and also uh, the floater floater type. Um, just to conclude on this site, um, what we see is that the implementation of those peak load reduction system um, are responsible of a cost increase uh, in globally to between 20 to 19 percent. But uh, this is uh, compensated for a Wincrete uh, floater uh, by 12 to 17 percent of the marine line price and 5% of decrease on the encore uh, prices. For the active float floater, it, it wasn't compensated by the decrease of the marine line and encores prices because um, we have uh, an issue on the, on the yield stiffness uh, that we didn't manage to, uh, to keep uh, using those, those systems. So just to give you uh, a, a, a last overview of what we managed to uh, to reach. Uh, so you have here the, the technology, TFI and EMS. Then you have the, the two different floaters and the different sites. So globally, what we see is that we uh, managed to reduce the price of the ring system for almost all the sites, except for uh, west of Barra and Moro Bay, um, because of uh, the harsh condition in West of Barra and the deep water that we have uh, in Morabi. So this is some um, some first conclusions um, that we uh, we have on those uh, on those systems. It's quite encouraging, and also we believe that the system might help to reduce a lot the fatigue. Uh, uh, on the marine system, and this is something that is ongoing also within this uh, this task. And uh, I hope we will be able to present to you uh, the results uh, on this in, in the next webinar. So thank you for your attention, and this is uh, pretty much everything for me. 
Thank you very much, Valentin. That was extremely interesting. I am sure everyone in the industry will appreciate to have a reduction in, in the mooring system, especially because for floating wind is so one of the main difference to bottom fixed. And these systems, uh, well, depending on the configuration can go costly or not. So thank you for that. And now we are going to move on to a different topic. So for that, I will ask uh, Maria Antoniette from Rumble to, to join me now. And she is gonna take us, uh, talk, talk to us about what are the, are the different operational maintenance strategies for floating wind. So over to you, Maria Antoniette. Thank you, Lizette. Um, yes, good morning. Um, as Lizette said, I will present the assessment of floating wind ONM strategies, uh, which were performed uh, within the COVID project. Mm. So, um, for the operation and maintenance and floating wind, um, we have to point out that this differs. This this differs from the ONM for fixed. Um, for um, this is the first one from the ONM from fixed bottom uh, wind, wind farms, uh, especially with regard to um, uh, larger distances from the port, um, floater motions, larger water depth, and new components which can fail. All these demands, um, of course, stand for alternative maintenance strategies, and this um, increases the ONM risk and brings a high uh, cost uncertainty with it. Uh, so therefore, um, there is a high need for an early stage planning and reliable cost uh, estimate to de-risk the O&M phase. Oops. Um, so the case study that we performed within CoWind uh, was done for two floater designs. Uh, and so the semi-submersible and the spa boy. Um, and they were all done for the three reference sites um, which all have varying met ocean conditions and water depth. So Morro Bay, West of Barra and Grand Canaria. All our findings uh, are published in the deliverable 4.2, which you can find on the comment website and you can download it there as well. Uh, the assessment um, was in general performed in three steps. So first we started with preliminary studies. Um, in those studies, um, we try to deduce the operational limits for um, the heavy lift operations, the tow-in operations, for the workability and transportability on the floater and on the vessels, and um, also operational limits um, for the CTB and SUV accessibility limit, uh, accessibility so for different vessel types. Um, the outcomes of those preliminary studies then served as input to the um, time-based um, OPEX model, which um, then was used to uh, optimize the resources and the availability of the wind farm and the operational expenditures over the lifetime. Um, the one major cost driver of offshore wind farms um, are the major component exchanges. Um, there exist various solutions um, which involve different types of vessels um, and this depends on the site and the wind turbine type. Um, due to larger water depths and floating wind, um, which are often the case, um, jack-up vessels can often not be used anymore which is why here on the right side when we look at just the floating um, wind type of structure uh, we have two two solutions um, which uh, which involve once the tow in to a port or to a sheltered area of the turbine or to perform the exchange on site using a floating crane vessel um, which is also called floating to floating because we have a floating vessel and a floating turbine um, so I will go into that a bit deeper on the following slides. So both of those scenarios, the floating to floating scenario and the towing scenario have been studied in the prelim preliminary studies. Um, here we have um, 
did use the operational limits uh, for both of these scenarios uh, using Orca flags and ANSYS Aqua, um, respectively, um, to compute these limits uh, based on the relative motions between the floater and the vessel uh, and based on motion criteria. Uh, as an outcome, we have those generic matrices of which you see some examples here on the bottom, uh, which then show the sea states in which a floating to floating lift or a tow in operation can be performed or in which they can't be performed. Um, in parallel to these preliminary studies, we performed um, studies uh, which were supposed to define the restrictive weather window for the offshore works, uh, so the day-to-day -day maintenance. Uh, for this, two kinds of operational limits have been studied in detail. First, the accessibility um, for crew transfer vessel or a service operation vessel. Um, and uh, secondly, the workability and transportability on the floater and the vessel. Um, so for the accessibility limits, um, we studied um, the access via the boat transfer using a crew transfer vessel and via um, a motion compensated gangway, um, which was positioned on a, um, a service operation vessel. Um, so there, the relative motions between vessels and flows are, have been um, have been studied um, and compared against uh, motion criteria, um, and uh, they help to deduce this um, generic matrix on the bottom. Um, uh, this is an example of those that have been created um, to to show in which um, sea states uh, it is possible to um, to access. Uh, the floating structure. For the workability and transportability assessment, um, the influence of the floater and the vessel motions on the human comfort uh, of the offshore workers, such as seasickness, so the, um, to the possibility to provoke seasickness, um, has been assessed uh, for both floater designs and um, for, uh, for the transport vessel. Um, the workability um, and transportability uh, limits were also presented in, in those generic matrices. And uh, at the end, the matrices showed that the limits uh, for the workability and transportability were rather high compared to the accessibility limitations, um, which is due to the fact that um, the studied floaters are rather large and massive structures, 50 megawatt structures. Uh, which have a quite calm motion behavior. Um, therefore, the accessibility limitations uh, were became the decisive factor for restricting the weather windows uh, for maintenance operations. Um, of course, I need to point out here that the motions of the coupled systems are always floater and site specific. Um, we have only analyzed the two comment floaters in this case. Um, the, when applying now the um, uh, the operational limits uh, for the for the access to the floaters um, in the OPEX model, uh, the choice of the accessibility method, so choosing now the operational limits for the boat transfer or for the um, uh, for the motion compensate gangway, uh, it showed that uh, here this was. The results were mainly driven by the um, weather conditions at the site. So in the calm region of Gran Canaria, um, both access solutions um, gave very much the same results on the OPEX. Um, at Morro Bay, where the average wave heights are a bit higher, uh, a clear trend um, could be uh, observed towards uh, the most compensated gangway solution. Um, when applying um, the, uh, or when comparing the major component exchange strategies, so choosing a major component exchange on site and comparing it to the case where we would tow the structure in to, um, to exchange a major component, um, there we could, uh, could see that um, uh, here definitely the, um, 
the floating to floating solution was more expensive in all of the cases. Um, this is, however, due to the short travels uh, to the port for the um, towing solution. Um, and also for the uh, because of uh, very high mobilization costs and day rates of the floating crane vessel in the other scenario. So um, they, they, of course, um, increase the cost massively for the floating to floating solution. Uh, which was due to the fact that uh, we assume that such vessels are rather scarce on the market and um, the the prices are still, still quite high. Um, and uh, of course, the towing solution, uh, the results can change when the distance to port increases. They, they would probably change because then um, the weather windows uh, become the more restrictive factor in that case. Um, so um, then we have also performed uh, some sensitivity studies on various input parameters um, of, the, of the model. Uh, and this showed that the mobilization costs and the day rates of the vessels have really a significant impact um, on uh, how the scenarios perform uh, in terms of OPEX. Um, I have now only shown the results from Gran Canaria and Morro Bay, and this is due to the fact that uh, when we um, modeled the site of West of Barra, um, the, we uh, observed this, uh, like significant availability losses and very unrealistic um, uh, operational expenditures, uh, which is due to the very harsh weather conditions at the site. Um, so only very 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 small weather windows were available for the for the day-to-day -day maintenance especially for major component exchanges they were they were almost not possible at all and this led to um, unfinished work orders and very high downtimes throughout the lifetimes which uh, which summed up um, so it was um, under those weather conditions it was not possible to find a cost-effective maintenance strategy um, under the assumptions taken for those three reference sites. Um, some more detailed studies in terms of innovative access solutions and innovative vessel types uh, have then not been investigated further. Um, but under those conditions that we have assumed, um, it was not possible to, to deduce a, um, a sensible O&M strategy, which would um, keep up a high availability of the wind farm, um, especially under the uh, wind farm layout that was chosen, which was 80 wind turbines in all of those three cases. Um, so quite many wind turbines to maintain, uh, which also then resulted in more failures than in a small wind farm and um, more maintenance actions that needed to be performed. Um, to conclude, um, uh, the tau in solution seemed uh, to be the most cost effective for the investigated scenarios, but this has to be assessed from a case to case. Um, the major cost driver for the floating to floating solution were the vessel costs. And here also future developments on the market um, might make this solution more attractive. Um, that means that when the vessel prices uh, could, would fall uh, in the case that there are more of this type of vessel available, um, then uh, this would definitely um, have a high potential in becoming uh, quite competitive to the um, tau in solution. And especially, um, there are not so many ports which are uh, suited to, um, to have a floater being towed in uh, to the port and being maintained there. So often there are large distances um, to be traveled for a tow in. Um, so this really has to be uh, taken into account. And uh, the larger the distance becomes, the more um, the tow in solution gets less attractive. Um, so one recommendation I have um, is that uh, also with regard to sites like the region of West of Barra, uh, especially when looking at the recent Scott Wind lease announcements, um, Rumble frequently performs uh, early assessments of operational limits for the major component exchange and day-to-day -day maintenance. Um, this is especially key to de-risking O&M and define uh, like most cost-effective strategies. 
So doing an early stage planning of, of those operational limits is, is quite decisive. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. And I give the word back to Lisette. Over to you, Lisette. Thank you very much, Maria Antoniette. That was very interesting. And I also got to see from your map that some of the harsh uh, condition locations are part of the Scotwind uh, areas. So I'm sure the industry appreciates uh, all of our recommendations from, from your research. Now, I am calling Alvaro Rodriguez from IH Cantabria. Please bear with me. This will be our last presentation. And I see everyone is sending a lot of questions. So we will have a few minutes left for that. So over to you, Alvaro, please. Uh... Thank you, Lisa. Yeah. Okay, uh, as Lisa said, Alvaro, I am Alvaro Rodriguez from Madrid, Cantabria, and I'm going to be presenting on boring and cable dynamics, uh, both the experimental and the numerical approach that we follow. To begin with the agenda, first I'm going to show the objectives of the, pro of the piece of work that I'm presenting the experimental approach, the numerical one, and finally draw some conclusions. And to begin with the objectives, the, the point of this piece of work is that uh, the increasing complexity of, of the mooring lines and the power lines uh, are, are reaching the limitations of the current numerical and experimental methodologies with the inclusion of uh, sack bends, intermediate floaters, uh, the, presence, the presence of complex bathymetries, and, and uh, for example, we also have uh, some uh, bending stiffness in some materials, some uh, variable axial stiffness, and these these challenges need need to be need to be overcome in order to to be able to properly model this design. And the objective, uh, the proper objective in this in this case is to perform numerical and experimental tests uh, in an actual design. May for the for a mooring line, which was designed by by Inusi, the Valentin was talking previously, and also for a power table, which was designed by GDR. Uh, this was for a 15 megawatts floating offshore wind turbine, uh, in particular located at West Barra, and it's for the active float semi serviceable uh, platform. Um, these designs uh, present, as I said, bending stiffness and variable axial stiffness. Uh, we are also exposed to those designs to complex bathymetry configurations. Um, first, we will develop uh, some new experimental techniques. Uh, we will adapt our numerical models and expand them in order so they can meet these new requirements. And then we will show some calibration and validation. Uh, the background for this piece of work is the thesis from Carlos Barrera, uh, in which we already performed some tests on the on a channel with a mooring line. And in this research, we saw the importance of the acceleration of the mooring line, depending on the periods and the amplitudes of the forced oscillations. Um, in high frequency, we see snap loads, and, and those are the harder to predict and the most damaging for the structure. Um, those were more or less the results of this work and the start point for this new one. Uh, we also found that the hydrodynamic loads were not were not really relevant for the for the tension in the line. Now for the experimental approach in this in this work, we we improved the we we, we got a similar setup, but we improved the device. To impose, that we used to impose the forced oscillations. We, we chose a, a lab scale of 1 to 75. And we also put a cell, we measured the tension at the parallel and also at the anchor, which hasn't been done so many times. And the most, the, the newest uh, introduction that we, uh, we made was uh, using a tracking system with cameras to follow the position of each point of the line. Uh, which allows us to have simultaneously the, the tension signal and the movements of any point of the line signal. This was, the, this was done at the Kokotsu, the, the channel I present at IH Cantabria, and more than 400 forced oscillation tests uh, were conducted uh, for this purpose. I think I have to click twice. 
and here we have the first results. Uh, we have the um, an old chain, the design, uh, and we have a comparison in the graphs of the on the right of three different slopes, uh, and for two different time series. This one is the slower one, uh, what we call a quasi-static case, in which the, the frequency of movement is slow, and in the bottom we have the high frequency. Uh, we see the, the importance of the different slopes that were placed. These slopes were chosen based on the bathymetries that were present in the different sites. Uh, we could previously see these bathymetries in the presentation in the presentation of Cos Ignacio from IREC, uh, where he was optimizing the layout. Um, and we see how important it is, especially for the width or the peak tensions in this case, uh, to consider different bathymetries configurations. We, for choosing the, the cases that we are representing, uh, we were based on the simulations from, from um, sorry, from Innocy. Um, and we try to span those simulations in regular tests to, to try to go a little bit further and test the limitations of the, of the numerical models later on. Here we have some results of, of work done by the line on the fairlet. Uh, to do so, we, we use the tracking system to measure the, the angle at the fairlet of the line. And this let us compute the work done at the fairlet. And we have the, this force against displacement cycles. And the area inside of the cycles is the work for different for different cases and different configurations. And we see how the work extracted uh, depends directly on the period, which was known previously, uh, previously but now it's also done uh, for different slopes. And in this case, uh, we have uh, similar figures, but here is for the for a line composed of nylon and chain. Uh, to use this nylon to reproduce this line on line, uh, we had to, to characterize several materials and choose the similar one, the most similar one. Here are the cycles that we uh, imposed to, to our rope. And we found that this was uh, in the market one of the most similar to the design from Minus C. So we chose this one. And here we have the, the time series results of the peak tensions. And we see how it also affects, uh, depending on the, on the sea floor, it also affects a lot the the peak tensions for the for the chain and nylon configuration. And finally, we have the we have the stack band uh, with the cable with the power cable, and we we perform some tests to also to calibrate some numerical models. And in this case, in the top right of the of the slide, we see the 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 movement of the in in horizontal and vertical of the lower lowest point of the stack. To keep going with the numerical approach, I'm gonna speak a little bit of the numerical model that we implemented. And uh, we have the normal governing equations uh, used generally in the industry, which is a, a nonlinear wave, second order wave equation. And we have uh, some external forces, which would be uh, the hydrodynamic loads, the gravity, then we have the internal forces of the of the axial stiffness, which can be linear or nonlinear. Uh, but in the seabed, we we will be working specially, and we are solving this problem spatially uh, with a gauss lobato lagrange polynomials of high order, uh, with a continuous Galerkin approximation, and then uh, in the time domain with a second order backward differentiation formula uh, with adaptive with adaptive time step. Then for the numerical with interaction with the seafloor, uh, we have a smooth uh, previous ex existing model uh, from Pound, which is generally used in the industry, uh, but for further convergence and stability of the model of the of the model, we used some smoothing in the in the front of some functions. And also we introduced a stick slip friction model, which allows us to model the, the static friction at the floor, which we found that was important uh, for the tensions on the angle. And um, our biggest achievement, probably, is introducing this new uh, complex bathymetry interaction model with a triangulation of the seafloor that allows us to compute the normal vector at each point of the seafloor. And 
we and to project all nodes of the line on different point on, onto this uh, surface. Uh, once we have the projection, we can compute the normals and the tangent forces, and and the model behaves just fine as shown in these in these figures. Now with the calibration and validation, we have some calibration here with the static test. Um, this is a tension deformation test for the Mullen line, in which the, the line is left to remain stable before measuring the tension. And we made sure that the coefficients that we were taking of length, position of the anchor, etc., were properly taken, and, and we got a, a good agreement. And then we also uh, performed some regular tests that are shown here. This is the case for the flat seabed that we are uh, making just for, for reference. Uh, and we see how the model behaves by itself without considering the complex facility, which is uh, we are happy with the results. And now we have here a case with uh, with the complex bathymetry. We can see here how the how the slope appears and and the and the, the line adapts to it. And here we would see a, a, when it's flat again. Okay. Uh, the the tension deformation curve is fits also fine, and the the peak tensions are predicted with uh, with good accuracy considering the the limitations of the model. Now to draw some conclusions. Uh, first, a new experimental methodology for tracking the position and the tension simultaneously uh, for any moving line or power line was, was developed and improved from previous works. Uh, then we also considered variable axial stiffness and bending axial stiffness, which was experimentally reproduced and characterizing el elastic materials and we also introduced some new methodologies to do so. In third place, complex bathymetries were used uh, and the importance of, of using them in the, in the experiments and in the numerical uh, simulations was on. And finally, a mooring line numerical model capable of considering advanced seafloor interaction models and, and also advanced uh, mooring lines uh, designs was, was calibrated and validated. Uh, these these results uh, led to to the publication of two conference papers uh, that we will be presenting soon, and also are published in the deliverable 5.2 uh, of Corwin, which is in the webpage. Just in case you want to know a little bit more. And now for the further steps, uh, we we will perform some fully coupled experimental testing program in the basin with waves and the full platform being simulated. We will apply what we have learned previously. And in this case, we will couple these simulations where we have a, hybrid, a software in the loop a hybrid a simulation concept with a drone applying the aerodynamic forces in the platform. We will couple it, we will couple it with the, the wind tunnel results at, at Milano, at Politecnico de Milano, which, which will which will couple the result, the experimental results from, from the wind tunnel with the experimental results from the wave basin and may try to make a new methodology for a better uh, testing of these devices. And um, that's all from my side. Thank you for your attention. I think that I now it's time for the for the questions. Is it? Thank you very much, Alvaro. That was very interesting too. I I was not aware that the two parts uh, in your last slide are done, one in Italy and the other in Spain. So it would be interesting to couple these models and see where these the new simulations take us uh, for the industry. Now, I want, I want to invite all of our uh, speakers to please join us. Uh, uh, also, Alvaro, <laughs> it's already here. Uh, so please turn on your cameras. And now we're going to go through some of the questions. I see that there are many, many questions. And let's see then uh, what people want to know from this project. So first question, um, sorry, I'm going through the questions because I've been paying a lot of attention. Okay, so how, Yes, sorry.
Okay, so we have a few questions for first on the part of uh, Jose, sorry, which is um, which layout um, would be best uh, for facilitating potentially on sharing of the seabed anchors? And uh, why will the bathymetry and soil conditions uh, determine the layout? Well, if we want to share the anchors, then that's a different approach for the optimization because now we consider that all the turbines are independent. And if we consider shared anchors, then we cannot assume that. Uh, then the, from the layout perspective, the LCOE reduction would be lower, uh, but on the other hand, of course, uh, the fact of sharing anchors would be, would be greater. In this case, the optimization, as I said, would not be uh, moving uh, independently the turbines around the site. Instead, uh, I think the point there should be defining maybe a staggered array of, of turbines and defining fixed uh, spacing in the, in the wind direction, in the parallel wind direction uh, and perpendicular to the wind direction. Thank you for that. Uh, that's very clear. Now we have also another question that is uh, related to, okay, sorry, I have to open this bigger. Uh, for Valentin, the TFI option results in a reduced max load, but fatigue loading seem a bit higher for the ultimate load case shown. Well, will that be the situation for a day-to-day sea -day states as well, and so have a consequence on line grade needed? So I didn't really get the question. So basically, the, the question is about the, the impact of, uh, of the system on fatigue, uh, as understood. Yes, uh, if, if it will be the the day by today sea states and uh, yeah, on looking at why the fatigue loads seem a bit higher than the ultimate load case. Okay, so um, maybe there was a misunderstanding on the presentation because we didn't presented any fatigue uh, uh, analysis uh, results. So what I, I say is that for now we we perform. Uh, ULS uh, cases, uh, basically 6.1 and, and 6.2, which are uh, ultimate cases with uh, 50 with 50 years uh, written period uh, environmental conditions, and it gave us um, some optimized marine system for for ULS analysis, and in parallel we are performing uh, fatigue analysis on, on the the third generation of optimized uh, marine system without those those systems. And what I said is that uh, we believe that uh, using those, those type of system uh, in, the, in, the, in the marine system might also help to reduce uh, the, the loads, uh, the fatigue loads in, in the system uh, by using maybe some uh, lower stiffness uh, system and then uh, help uh, to reduce the fatigue uh, within the marine system. So I hope it answers the questions. I have a follow-up that it's uh, more straightforward for you, Valentin. Is uh, people is a bit confused on how did you uh, calculate the reduction in cost? So uh, did you consider the O? Sorry, did you consider the cost of the O and M that will allow the reduction of the peak loads? And if the um, what fraction of the total cost project is due to the moorings? Yeah. So yeah, that's that's a good question because uh, I mean we don't have the total price uh, considering O and M within this price. For now, it's only the price of, of the material, uh, which are uh, the, the marine lines and the anchors. And um, I mean O and M and also uh, installation costs are not uh, taken into account for now. Um, but it might might increase uh, the differences. Uh, between uh, the, the first generation of, of marine system and uh, the, the, the new generation with, with lower um, uh, chain size and grades. grades. Uh, and this will be taken into account within this work package too, because there is a specific 
uh, subtask that will foc that is focusing on this aspect and that will give us uh, the answers uh, on those price uh, aspects. Thank you for that one. We have also some questions regarding uh, the modeling uh, that was described at the beginning. Uh, so have the Corwin compared the PSO algorithm against the more usual deterministic algorithmic approach, algorithm approach? And also on how does the BIM tool apply to floating structures? Well, so, regarding the front one, yeah. well, oh, maybe Martin. Uh, no, I guess it's for you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I think yeah. it's more for Jose. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, uh, yeah. uh, regarding the first one, no, we didn't check that against the deterministic approach uh, because we are considering many variables that uh, would not be valid, but of course. Uh, if we did some simplifications, we could do the comparison. And regarding the second one, regarding the BIM, I think maybe Maria Antonia uh, could answer that. That's part of the introduction, but uh, it's just uh, yeah, the, the models that we are developing, the BIM models. I don't know. Uh... But what's the exact question regarding the BIM model? The, the question is, is how does the BIM tool apply to floating structures? I would say just the same as for fixed bottom structures. So um, the model is in fact just a 3D model, which you can then uh, visit. Um, and in terms of virtually walk around in it, um, it's, uh, the BIM model has information in the back layer of the model so that you would have certain data points within the model which you can then access while walking around with, within it and um, there you can of course uh, include any kind of information that you want so um, inspection data you can include uh, information about the material about um, if you like uh, uh, monitoring data for a certain um, uh, monitoring sensor uh, uh, on loads or whatever you uh, you would then have there, uh, so it's it, there's practically no limit to it. So this is this is how it would apply. Um, just just it's just a different three D model in that case. Uh, so just the same way as for fixed bottom going to find that. So. Thank you, Maria Antoniet. We can actually not see you. I'm not sure if, if you have a low bandwidth, but if possible, you can turn on your camera. I have a question for you, actually. Is uh, Do we have an estimate for how many kilometers between uh, floater plus turbine and harbor does it become a non-cost-effective option for O&M? Okay, can you see me now? I think we're, at least I, I can see Yes, we camera. can see you. We can see okay. you. Sorry. Um, uh, so this is a question. It's not so straightforward to to answer. Uh, to give like a an exact kilo, yeah, uh, value on the kilometers. Um, this is dependent on different factors. Um, so first of all, uh, especially the site conditions. If you have very calm water, you can of course travel much further. Um, and then when you have yeah, uh, harsher weather. Then, of course, um, uh, you you must uh, really uh, yeah, just it's it's you might have smaller weather windows, so uh, uh, smaller distances to travel are are more beneficial. Um, in general, I would say we have to uh, distinguish here between two types of port. Um, so I, I'm not sure for which one this this question is. Um, is, is aiming at, but uh, we have an O and M base, so where we have uh, from which we are uh, conducting our day-to-day -day maintenance, so any kind of inspection. Um, and here, I would say that it's, it's quite important to have a, a short distance, uh, because when you have when you would calculate with a general uh, shift of 12 hours for the maintenance workers. Uh, you always have to uh, subtract the travel time from that. So if you already travel for an hour um, to the, to the um, wind farm, uh, you have also the way back is one hour. So we have two hours less uh, of that you can actually then spend in the wind farm to perform the works. 
um, and the more this increases, uh, the less time you have for your actual repairs, which make uh, the maintenance less effective and puts more pressure on the workers to, um, to perform it fast and um, yeah, which again is an HSE risk. Um, so we, um, uh, then the second one would be um, for, for large component exchange. This does not necessarily need to be the same port as not, not many ports have this capability of um, yeah, uh, having a space enough, enough space to have a floater um, in the port um, or like uh, the water depth of the port also needs to be um, significantly uh, deep. And um, here, uh, I would say uh, this again depends definitely on the grouping, on the on the way that you have to go. Um, maybe you have to go around a, a certain area which uh, which you cannot cross uh, due to some reason, um, or uh, also maybe you have an area with uh, with certain um, uh, current conditions which are unfavorable. Um, so that has to be respected as well. Um, and uh, again, here the weather conditions are quite uh, quite important. And uh, it's it's difficult to say how many kilometers it's it's there. This is this really has to be assessed from case to case study. Um, uh, I would say for the ONM port, uh, you would look at the travel time um, uh, so for the day to day maintenance to keep it rather low. This also depends on the vessel speed, and um, yeah, of course, for the tow-in solution, this also depends on how easy is it to deconnect your floater, how fast are you with this, and um, then how how well can you travel um, to that uh, specific port? And uh, yeah, just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we we see it's not that straightforward, uh, but it's very complex. And, and thank you for that. The last one, very short and concise for Alvaro, is if you can mention uh, which tools and softwares uh, you have used for your model. I think you are muted, sorry. Yeah. No, I'm not muted anymore. And it's our own implementation of the model. The numerical model that we're presenting at the end is our own implementation. Uh, the software, the full software, which also includes the possibility of simulation of floating, uh, floating bodies. It's called Oasis, and I, we are working on it as an internal tool. Okay, that's super clear. Well, thank you, everyone. I see we have already gone uh, slightly through the time, so uh, enjoy the rest of the day. I just want to again thank uh, our speakers today for this extremely insightful presentation. Please don't hesitate uh, to go to the Corwind uh, social media, Twitter, LinkedIn, and website to find more information and all of the deliverables. And we look forward to continue bringing you more updates. Have a lovely day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.